potatoes to cool down a little bit. Really I've had the sewing machine out. Probably for the last time. <laughs> How long? Because look, Bryony did a little drawing. <laughs> I never thought I'll match those together. Yes, you did. I did not. I did not, I promise you. So now it's time to get on and do some cooking. No, it isn't. What have I forgot? The only thing that I have definitely matched in my life is belt to shoes. No, this is absolutely not true, everybody. Maybe I could eat the gravy like a soup, in all honesty, because it's just so delicious. Look, whatever. I guarantee he likes you, to coordinate I've never coordinated all his my accessories. Belt <laughs> Although now I secretly want to. Right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make our filling. So the, you know, the beef filling thing. Just for a moment, because you've just had a go at me for being matched, I right? match projects to bags, I've never denied that. Welcome! Everybody to the Bakery Bears video show and hold your horses. Hold your horses. I wonder where that comes from. <laughs> I was clock, just about to clock. say, where does that come from? But it's obvious, isn't it, where it comes from? Where does it come from? Well, it's just like people would say, hold the horses. Oh, yeah, I get and, that. But yeah. I just wonder when it started oh. to be used. Well, when people had horses. Horse and carriages. Horse, well, horse and carriages. Yes, horses yes. and carriages. Even before. Well, well, no, there weren't always carriages. You would have always have had to have pulled the horses. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Hold your horses. I'm getting on. You know, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. All oh, right, so people what would have said What did you think it. you meant? I don't know. I'm lost. Look, we're only... <laughs> we're 20 seconds in. And we're waffling. And, and already, already we're off on a tangent. <laughs> the reason why you need to hold your horses is because... This is very exciting. Case Cozy Kitchen is back, baby! Yes! And this time, oh my goodness, she's sharing with you like one of the crown jewels. Crown jewels. Because one of the questions which we've been asked the most since we changed our diet, and to be honest, really since we started broadcasting, mm. because we're quite active, because we're always out adventuring, or you're out walking, mm. or I'm out running, how do we fuel that lifestyle? Well, today, it's the moment. The beauty of what Kay's sharing with you today is you can completely gorge yourself on it and be fine tomorrow. Well, I wouldn't say that. I that's what that... I did the other night. <laughs> well, you did. Well, you did. You did have two helpings of it. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, as I've said many times before, I now have the constitution of a small child. So for me to be able to, to do that and not even think about it the day after, mm. that's the type mm. of food I want to eat. Because mm. the other thing it does as well is it gives you that energy to get up and go and... Yeah, I mean, it does have a little bit of, tiny bit of butter in it and you use a tiny bit of oil for cooking things, but in the grand scheme of things, it's, you know, for a main meal, it's it's pretty good. You do, I, don't, I don't ever feel... We had it twice, actually, because we had it for lunch the next day because there's so much. And we don't ever feel so weighed down. Prepare like yourselves, because yeah. this is... It, it's a really tremendous recipe that mm. you've perfected over the years and it's just gorgeous it's my absolute favorite and it's one of the sort of staples so you've been yeah. asking for this you want to know what fuels the bakery bear lifestyle this is definitely one of those yeah. crown jewels yeah. and there's more of those crown jewels coming later on in the series now look we were of course planning this time yes but if you recall in the last episode we said weather permitting yeah. Next yeah, time we'll be yeah, walking yeah, the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, let me tell you this. Preparation was perfect. It was. Everything yeah. was going like a dream. I checked the weather the day before. I checked the weather. It was about 7 a.m. the morning mm -hmm. of. Everything was looking perfect. Mm -hmm. Fairly still wind. Well, the wind doesn't affect us too much now with the amazing Stuart, the new yeah, drone. But no, the wind was low because I wind was good. As well. No rain. Yeah, wind was good. 5% chance of rain. Yeah. So off I set. And do you know what I saw when I got there? Torrential rain. <laughs> <laughs> so I got out of the car. I even put on my. You were going to go. I was. You were going to go because you, te you texted me and said, oh, I can't believe it, it's raining, but, I, you know, I'm just going to put my raincoat on and go for it. I put my raincoat on, and that was the moment when I thought, this isn't going to work, because I did look a little bit like a tadpole. 
Well, it's not just that. It's the equipment and the wet, well, um, th- which don't that is, mix. That is absolutely yeah. it. As you saw in episode one of Walking the Wall, there's never been a series that we've done that is more in my wheelhouse than this. What does that mean? That means it, it's right up my alley. More in your wheelhouse? Yes, that's an expression. Don't worry. Okay. Don't worry. So it, this is a series which has been years in the preparation, and I'm spending more time planning these shows than I ever have done with anything that we've done before. And also, with the new equipment that we've got, I've been able to plan the most, the the coolest location shoot possible. And it just became apparent that I could have gone and shot because the majority of the equipment is waterproof, but I would have had to have made amendments. Mm. For example, you can't really fly the drone in pouring rain. Mm. And so it would have just changed the shoot completely. So I phoned up. My partner in crime. Yes. In desperation, I got a phone call. I gave Kate a call. And you'd gone all the way there, you know. It's about an hour away. And you'd gone all the way there. And I was like, oh... I can prove it. Look. This is me driving. (laughs) You don't need to... To the spot. (laughs) And yes, Um, I pulled up and mm. gave you a call. Mm, mm. And it just... It made total sense to postpone it till next time. Mm, So mm. fear not... It will be back yes. because we are now pushing into already the weather is now. Yeah, I mean, it, it rained that day and then it also rained the following day. So, you because you did say, well, I could come back tomorrow, but the rain was predicted the following day and it was. And the weekend was dodgy, to be honest. Yeah, and we, you know, the, the weekend was dodgy and then we're into this week and it's, but you know, to we, be honest, you, you need the whole enough reason, time to edit and all of you that. Do. So. And the whole reason why this year, the reason why we did this series this year was because. We knew with us having two amazing series from Kay that we could keep our rotational tradition. Mm. Last time we had My Favourite Colourways. This time, Walk in the Wall was planned, but instead we get an amazing, the next wonderful mm. cosy kitchen. Mm. And so Walk in the Wall just gets postponed one. So we're not losing anything. No. What we're we gaining. We just change things around. You know, we've, you've got to do that. What we we're need. gaining. You've got to adapt and change to the circumstances. You know, we live in this supposed technological world where we know everything actually let's look back at back to the future and when they predicted in 2015 we'd be able to yeah. predict to the second when the weather would change yeah because that's what happens yeah. isn't it? Doc brown yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah to the second well look we're now 2022 and we still haven't got a clue no but also they did say we'd have flying cars in 2015 so that also hasn't happened. Yes, that is true. My, my point is, though, when you watch a meteorologist, mm. they talk like... Well, no, I, I think, obviously, much we can predict the weather way better than we could sort of 50 years ago. But you still can't really rely on the weather forecast, I don't it's think. It's their best guess. And, my theory is this. They work nine to five. Because I checked the weather at seven. I got in the car and drove. It's pouring with rain. I checked the app again. Instead of having 5% chance of rain all day, it was now 80 to 90% chance of rain all day. Yeah, yeah. So at some point... That's a dramatic change in the space of an hour, isn't it? Yes. So I'm telling you, they turned up at work. They checked their weather station outside in the garden. Quick, change Northumberland. Yes. yes. (laughs) We got it completely wrong. We guessed it yesterday. We got it wrong. Let's change it and make it right. Look, enough of this. Enough of this waffle, because, my goodness, what a show we have in store. Because, I mean, first of all, look what Kay's wearing. I'm wearing a hand-knitted item today. I'm wearing my cascades that Dan knit me. You are indeed. You remember it, by Michelle Wong. Can you remember the yarn, though? Yes, I can. That's amazing. It was knit with King Cole, Merino Blend, DK. Wow. And the colourway I had to really ponder on this morning. I thought it was something to do with mushrooms. I'll tell you if you get it right. And then it came to me. It's truffle. It's truffle. Yes. And it's, it's lovely. It's it really is. Lovely. I mean, you it's look. It's nice and long. Yes. Yeah. Which you love. I do love. It's tremendous. Yeah. It's so yeah. lovely. I love a long jumper. Yes. Yes, we have so many wonderful things to show you. And also some great what's. I mean, it's. Well, I suppose yes. it is what's off your needle. Oh right, no. I've, yes, I've got. I've got three finished things today. One of them is not a knitted thing. It's so. off a. A sewing machine. Yes. <gasps> Very exciting. I've had the sewing machine out. <laughs> Probably for the last time. <laughs> I didn't really enjoy it, I've got to say. I just wanted the thing, and I'm very happy to have the thing. 
I didn't really enjoy the process, but I'll, t I'll tell you about that later. Definitely. More of that later on the show, because right now it's time for me to ask Kay Jones, what's on your needles? Well, today, this matches my top actually it does. pretty well, doesn't it? And um, so does her nails, and so does her slippers. I'm coordinated today. Dan's very happy about that because Dan likes coordinating his socks with his top, with his hat. And don't, I realised something ask. the other day. I posted something in our patrons' private Facebook group. I, I was going out for a walk and I got out one of my oh, yeah. combinations of, of knitwear that I like mm, to wear when I go mm. out for a walk. I never thought I'd be a man that had a combination of knitwear that he liked to wear. You've always been like that, honey. You've always anyway, been like that. Moving swiftly <laughs> on. And I looked at the picture and I thought, hold on a minute, they all, all those items look similar. Because they were all sort of one colour -y. They were all tonally. They were all sort of um, tonals or solid yarns, weren't they? And then I thought, yeah. uh, well, I've got another set that I normally wear. I'm going to get those out and I'm going to see what they look like. And I got mm -hmm. those out and they were all more sort of colourfully. Mm -hmm. Variegated. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So without even realising it, I never thought I'll match those together. Yes, you did. I did not. Yes, I did not. I promise you. The only thing that I have definitely matched in my life is belt to shoes. No, this is absolutely not true, everybody, because many a time you'll come down and they'll say, oh, look, look, socks, belt, T-shirt, hat. Socks, belt. I've never said socks, belt. I may have said... <laughs> look, whatever. I guarantee likes you, to coordinate I've never coordinated all his my accessories. belt with my socks. <laughs> Although now I secretly want to. What is in your bag? Oh, yes. Well, in my lovely bag, I've got it in my lovely Harry's Tweed bag that I made, gosh, a few years ago now, and I lined it with Liberty Lawn fabric. I didn't like this fabric, I'll be honest. I didn't like working with it. I know it's vastly popular, the Liberty Lawn. I love, I love Liberty, and I have used Liberty quilting fabric, and that's lovely, I really love that. But this lawn fabric, you'll know, won't you, if you've used it, is super thin. Do you know what, it, do you know what it's the equivalent of? It's the equivalent of the Hobonichi paper in the planners. It's super thin and silky, but it's cotton. I just found it really sort of... In theory, brilliant. In practice, Yeah, useless. I just found it really sort of... You've got to be careful. It's not very grippy and things, but it's super pretty. So, Look. yeah, in my... Now, can I just say, bag. can we pause for a moment? Because you've just had a go at me for being matched, I right? I match projects to bags. I've never denied that. Who doesn't do that? Come on, let's be honest. You match what you match, I match what I match. Everybody's with me on the project Here and the, the bag matching. Yes. Thank you very much. But yes, it does actually match, which I didn't do deliberately, but you know. But in the lovely bag, I've got a pair of socks and I'm knitting my crinkled socks kit that I got from the Barra Wool Company. If you remember, Susan put these kits in her shop a little while ago now, maybe month or so, month, six weeks ago. And it's my crinkled socks pattern and there's a kit for it, to, you know, to knit it. You have to go and buy the pattern separately, but you can purchase the yarn to knit them. And I finally started them and oh, and I love them. I wonder if I could put it on a blocker actually, what I've done, oh. probably, yeah, I think I could, I think I could. This yarn is, it's very, a, it's, it's really it's lovely unlike yarn. unlike any yarn I've ever touched. It's the, the yarn that's in there, it's Susan, it's Susan B. Anderson is the person behind Barrett Wool, Co Barrett Wool Company, I'm sure you all know. But this particular base, this is the pink that I've got, is the home fingering and it's 100% American wool. I'm not sure what type of wool it is. So there's no nylon in there, but it's got a really lovely tight twist to it and it's super plump. It really is really, really plump. I mean, you get 370 yards to 100 grams, and she quotes a stitch gauge on US size one of eight stitches to the inch. So it's definitely sock gauge. And because it's so plump, I was like, gosh, will I actually get that gauge? But I, I absolutely did. So I'll put the, the sock on a blocker. I'm sort of halfway down the foot of the first one. And I'll show you that. But I did, because this yarn was so new to me, this is the colour I got, by the way. It's Priscilla and Field are the colours. So you get 100 grams of the main colour and then two of these mini skeins. I think these actually weigh 25 grams each. This Field is gorgeous. It's like a goldeny, mustardy, olivey sort of colour. It's really lovely. 
And because I hadn't worked with this yarn before, I thought, you know, I'm just going to do a little swatch and just check my gauge just to make sure that I can get the right gauge on what needles. So I, I start, I, I just cast on half the number of stitches for a sock. So instead of 64, I cast on 32. And I just worked at the top of like a little mini sock with two and a half millimetre needles is what I'm using. And I absolutely got eight stitches to the inch on two and a half, which I think is a US 1.5, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I got it on a two and a half millimetre. So I was really pleased with that. And I was really glad that I'd taken the time to swatch. I would never normally do that for socks. But because this yarn was so new to me, I wanted to do that. So got gauge and I cast on. And here is my progress. Doesn't it look great? It does. I love it. Yes. It's so, this this yarn, it is, you know, um, the, the yarn is beautiful. It's good, it's really soft. Well, I, you know, it is soft. There's not, honestly, not a prickle in it. You could use this for a baby, absolutely no problem whatsoever. But it is very plump. So, although I am getting the right gauge, it's a very dense fabric, which is brilliant for socks, isn't it? You know, the wear factor will be fantastic. But it is a little bit tough on my hands because it's such a tight gauge. So I'm having to quite take my time with it, which is perfectly fine, isn't it? You know, if it takes me a little while. And I'm just doing shorties because I don't really have any, don't really have any short socks. And I just thought because my idea with these actually is because they are so squishy and cosy, I thought I would have them as like pyjama socks. So a little short sock for me is better these days with my heat situation. Although, newsflash. Oh, guess yes, what? Viewer made recommendation. I can't remember the name of the viewer, but yes, yeah, somebody commented. Thank you so much. Who, yeah, who thank made you this so comment. much because I've tried this and it's definitely helping. It's not eradicating the hot flushes by any means, but it's definitely helping. And she recommended peppermint oil and just to rub some on the back of your neck when you know you, you feel a hot flush coming on and she said it really helps and I was a bit dubious thinking could that really help but then I thought of how when whenever Bryony has a cold or anything we always when she goes to bed we always put Vicks vapor rub on her chest and on the bottom of her feet and that was another viewer who recommended it the bottom of the feet bottom of for the feet stopping coughing. for stopping coughing and do you know what it works it absolutely works and whenever we do that and she's got a bit of a cough with a cold never bothers her through the night and we've done that since she was about eight so now and, and these days she's like oh i forgot to you know she very rarely gets a cold these days but you know that really works so yeah i tried the peppermint oil i got like a little roller ball of one because i thought that'd be handy for just putting on the back of my neck and it, it does make a difference. So yeah, here's my crinkled sock and I'm past the gusset decreases now, I've really not got that far to go until I get to the toe. And it really gorgeous, you know, gorgeous yarn. And it's just been so lovely to try a different yarn for socks. And I, I wouldn't hesitate in knitting socks again out of 100% wool. I've not got a problem in it not having nylon because, you know, <sighs> Socks wear out. Even with nylon, socks wear out eventually, don't they? And you just replace them, and we all love to knit. So if things lasted forever, we wouldn't be able to knit more of them, would we? So right. we don't really want things to last forever. And I'll just enjoy it while it's there, and I'll darn them if they need darning. And then you can just knit another pair, can't you? And you get the joy of knitting another pair, so I've not got a problem with that. So, yeah, I'm, I love the yarn. I think it's really just gorgeous and the you know the colours are lovely and I'm using ah now I'm using I spoke last time didn't I about Knit Pro Novas I think I said that I was I'd gone back to using a Knit Pro Nova from years ago that I'd used you know donkeys years ago to knit socks and so it was an old needle and I was just really loving it so I thought oh I'm going to go and buy another one because I wanted to see whether they changed over the years and they, ha they have, it has changed. The packaging is exactly the same. So it's Knit Pro Nova, two and a half millimeter. And the needle tip itself is perfectly lovely, nice and smooth, not got a problem with the needle tip. What I think has changed is, you know, the join here, it's not as smooth, nowhere near as smooth as my original one, which is, it might be eight years old, nine years old. 
it's not that you know when you're pushing because in knitting magic loop i think one of the most important things is you've got a smooth transition here between your cable and your needle tip because you're constantly pulling it round aren't you and if you haven't got a smooth transition it's just irritating and this one isn't particularly smooth it's sort of i sometimes have to really you know do that to get it over the bump so that's not not the best and also the cable is different the composition of it it's not as stiff and i think it might be a little bit thinner as well than the original i need to compare compare them side to side but i quite like that this is a bit more bendy now i've not got a problem with that but i really liked the old one so you know given a choice i would use the older one as opposed to this new one Things change and evolve, don't they? But I think when they're perfectly fine, it's just a bit annoying that they change it to something that is not quite as good. In any case, I'm really enjoying knitting these. So if you bought a kit and you haven't cast them on yet, I'd really encourage you to do that because the yarn is just lovely and I can't wait to have the socks to wear. Probably, you know, this autumn, I would think I'll save them maybe because warmer weather's coming now, isn't it? But brilliant as little house socks as well. Dan Jones. What's on your needles? That's a whole lot of knitting. Three things. Look, first of all, it's my body of my Alexander jumper in the Let Lopi, which is lovely. Yeah. I was just checking the length there, and it, it, I, I mean, I obviously checked it before I finished knitting, but it doesn't matter because, look, everything's still attached. So oh. even if I wanted to go a little bit longer, beauty of Let Lopi is though, the, the spit splicing is unbelievable. I think it's if you like just put it side by side perfection. like that, it would just do it by itself. <laughs> totally superb. So you could easily add it on you extra. You just tucked your yarn into your shirt. Yeah, I know, so it doesn't drop. Oh, right. So there's one body. There's only one body. Here's the first sleeve with the colour work on the bottom. Lovely. Which I think looks really great. Here's the second sleeve. Wow. Which the increases are finished. I've just got a b quite a bit more length. I was knit. just about to say you forgot to put the colour work on and then I remembered. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's forgot. And no, no. I remembered that's how it should be. No, no. This is called style. There's a picture in the pattern. There's actually a picture with it on both and also with it on one. And I really thought that it looked a lot more sort of cool and stylish with it just being on one. Yes. It's a little bit different. And it was perfectly pleasant to knit you know, didn't have a problem. I don't seem to have a problem with sleeves whatsoever. I really enjoy knitting them. And yeah, I sort of, it's perfect bedtime knitting, especially with the increases too, because there's just enough to think about. But to be honest, I can in a sort of session, a bedtime knitting session, I can do an increase, knit through, get to the next increase, but then stop and then start with the increase then the next day. So you always sort of, but I use, people often ask me, how do I keep tally of where I'm at? I use a row counter on every sleeve that I do. So I'm, I'm always, I mean, I, I bet you would have thought most people would do that, wouldn't you? So you, so you know how many rows there are completely on the sleeve? Yeah, I'm constantly using a row counter. So that uh, way but then, then you know at which point you do your increases, what yes. row numbers you do your yes. increases, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So th there's no sort of counting in my head guesswork or anything like that. It's all done absolutely. I know a lot of people use like light bulb stitch markers and they mark every increase, don't they? No, I just... I wouldn't do it that way either. I would I would do it something similar to the way you do. I'd, I'd, I'd sort of tick them off as I go along, I think. But anyway, so and this, gorgeous this young, colourway rough is sea. the rough sea. Yes, That's I don't right. need to check my bands. Well, it doesn't say it on it, but is this one of the bands from the rough sea? I've no idea. All oh, right, OK. <laughs> Well, I won't show you this shade number in case this isn't the rough sea. But it is the rough sea. But it's rough sea. So it's let low peak rough sea, and it's and it's the one that sort perfect. of it reads grey, but actually when you look at it close up, it also reads greeny, a yeah. greeny sort of colour. Very greeny, very yeah. sea. -y. Like it lots and lots. Exactly as it describes a rough sea, because they are grey, but then you also get those sea colours, don't you? It looks like the Irish sea. Yes. What else is on your needles? I have been working on my cardigan. Woohoo! So, it's garments galore today. I know, hey. Kay's wearing one. I know. I've shown you mine. Hey, this is cool, isn't it? And now you show me yours. My cardigan is in my lovely, ooh, bag that I made, which is the, I can't remember the name of this fabric again. It's all, it's taffeta. Taffeta, thank you. I was going to say organza. I know. 
It's silk taffeta. I bought my bag of present. When I bought, I showed you last time, I bought some stitch markers from Jules, which are Swarovski crystals. I saw this. Someone's been to Swarovski. I know. Jules has. I bought this because I thought it would look lovely on my bag. And look, it's a little moonstone. Can you see? How pretty is that? It's meant to be a progress keeper, but I find the ones that have quite big stones like this, they're just a bit too heavy for me to hang on to a stitch. I find it pulls on the stitch a bit. So I, I bought this with the intention of it being a zipper pull adornment. But yes, in my lovely bag is my cardigan. I'm knitting a few rows on this every morning with my early morning knitting. I find that that's working quite well for me because I know then that I'm just making a tiny bit of progress every day. Because this is going to be, you know, and it is a long-term project. I'm very aware of that. But I don't want to ever sort of put it into a project bag and not work on it for two weeks because that does tend to happen with quite a lot of projects. You know, other things get priority and something will go more on the back burner and because there's no agenda for this as such I don't want that to happen so I am doing a few rows every day so this is how much oh the colour looks fabulous actually in the light today this is how much I've done now I think when I last showed you I've just done a couple of repeats of the pattern. I've now done five repeats. And it's a, the very long rows. Let me see if I can stretch it out just so you can see the pattern a bit more. There you go. Isn't it pretty? It's a really simple but really pretty lace pattern. So yeah, this is the cardigan that I've designed for myself. And I'm just working away on the body now. I'm knitting it all in one piece. So I've got all of the stitches for the back and the two fronts just on one needle. And then my idea is that when I get to the underarms, it's going to be a fairly cropped cardigan. So I'm not even sure how, how far I need to knit. I need to measure some garments of my own, you know, that on me so I know the sort of length that I want. I don't want it to, be, I want it to sit sort of on my waist right, here, right. you know, so that when I'm sat, when I want to take it off, I'm not sat on it. Yes. Like I am with a lot of things, yes. it's the longer. It's very funny. Yeah. And I just get really annoyed because when I get hot, I'm hot. And if I'm wearing a cardigan, it has to come off immediately. Otherwise I get cranky. <laughs> yeah. So my idea is that when I've got to the underarms, I'm then going to effectively separate off the sections. So I will, I'll do the, I'll sort of, if effectively I'll put like the remaining stitches on hold and I'll work on the front panel and get that done. And then I'll go on to the center back, you know, the back panel and I'll do that to the top. And then I'll have finally the other front and I'll do that to the top. Does that make sense? The only bit of seaming there will be is just the shoulder seams, I think. So, I mean, I'll, I'll seam the shoulder seams. So yeah, that'll leave an opening for the sleeves and then I'll just pick up stitches for the sleeves and knit them down. And then the only thing left to do then will be the collar. I'll just need to pick up for the collar. I have got to say, actually, that. I can't remember exactly which one it was. I'm hoping that works. But I really, really enjoyed knitting the sleeves on the projects that I did that started at the shoulder and worked down. Right. I really enjoyed doing that. I think it might have been the Samantha. Is that how you did this? No. Oh, were these separate? Did you knit these yes. bottom up? Yes. Right, okay. I think it was the Samantha. Right. That started on the top and worked and down. And worked down. And I really yeah. liked that because, well, I enjoyed the knitting process. Mm. I kept the project in the bag. I didn't take the project out That's of the bag. That's right. That's the only and thing. And I swiveled the bag. Yeah, that is the only thing, isn't it? You've got the whole of the project attached to your sleeve. But Once I got into my, it, that was fine. Yeah, my the plan is. Though, there's no issue with length. No, Mike, because you can put it on, can't you? I think and I can help it. you, though, with length. I'm sure I can help you with length. Well, this is a drop shoulder, is the only thing. So the, the sleeve will start here, effectively. That's, fine. that's like That's like the yoked ones. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah, but I will just put it on. I'll be able to just put it on. Yeah. Because... I, w I think what I'm going to do with the sleeves is I want them to be more like a sort of balloon or bishop sleeve. Just knit straight down and then rapid decreases before the cuff. That's what I'm thinking at. 
I'm just going to get, you know, see what I think when I get to it. And I'll, I'll work the sleeves on either a 16 inch circular, so a hat needle. But if that's too big, I'll, you can, can get 12 inch circulars and I have done sleeves on those. So I'll do that because I find that much easier than um, DPNs or I definitely wouldn't do magic loop for a sleeve. It's too many stitches. I don't like working magic loop when you've got quite a lot of stitches. So I'd never do a hat magic loop. I'm definitely a DPN boy when it comes to sleeves and socks and anything circular. Yeah, and I am really enjoying DPNs as well. My next project, I'm going to talk about DPNs because I'm using them for that. To be honest, I, I like all needles. I like Magic Loop for certain things. I like DPNs for certain things. I like long circulars. And I've also worked on straights as well, which sometimes working on straights just makes a real nice change. It makes me feel old-fashioned working on straights. You know, like I'm vintage. <laughs> but yeah I, I'm, I love this yarn and I love this colour I think it's a really good colour for me I think those autumny shades actually do um, suit me more than pale shades is that right? yeah so yeah Lovely. And, and the hang on I'll just say what the yarn is hang on hang on hang on so the yarn I'm using is the lovely BC Garn Samilla and it's in burnt orange the shade and I'm on to, this is still my second ball. I think they're 50 gram balls. Yes, they're 50 gram balls and you get 160 meters. So it's about sport weight, I think. So this is my second ball. So, and I've got quite a lot because I did overbuy for your vest that I was originally knitting this in. But yeah, that's my lovely cardigan, which I have given a sort of working name to, but I won't say what it is because I haven't fully decided if that's gonna be the name. No, well, I wouldn't do anything until you finish no. it. No, yeah, 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 and I'm sure it'll speak to me at that just point. Calm down. So I'm just going to carry on doing my two or three rows every morning, and it'll grow, won't it, that little bit every day? Look, look, one sock, all completed. Two socks, not completed. <laughs> it's a dump brock, and look, up here, I made an absolute pig's ear of it. Round here, I've got it all right. The cables, the cables are right. Okay. They are. Are the cables not right? Where have I gone wrong on the cable? On the cable. Down here. How? There's something not right down there, I think. Okay, cables are fine. It's not the cables. The cables are all lovely. It's lovely, it's lovely. It's all lovely. She's making me pound right now. I can't see a problem anywhere. I don't know. It just doesn't quite look the same as up here somehow. We don't need to break down the... No. It doesn't make particularly interesting viewing. It doesn't, does it? No. But <laughs> I'm telling you, the cable is perfect. The rest of the sock might not be, but the cable's perfect. And that's how I know the cable's perfect, because I've been focusing in. All my brain power is on making sure that that cable does not end up looking, looking like, like that. absolute rubbish. Yes, okay, the... The two by, t is it two by two? Is that the stitch repeat? It, you do two it's rounds broken, or two rounds. It's yeah. a broken two by two. Yeah, the broken two by two is a bit too much for my brain to deal with. Apparently. <laughs> sometimes, it's all over the shop. Sometimes it's two, other times it's three. I don't think there's any ones in there, although there might be. No, well, sometimes, yes, there is, because you've only done one knit row there, like, right, in there's, between. There's one. Quite a lot of times, look, there looks like there's three knit rows in between there. There's a one, there's a three. But look, it's textured. To drive me mad. You can't tell. I can tell. I can't tell, looking at it. I mean, <laughs> there is one line in it that's quite glaring. But yes, you can't tell. Look, it's all textured. It's all textured and lovely. That's the beautiful thing about patterns like this. They're so forgiving. They I'm are. not saying anything because would I'm look. Everyone's looking and going. Oh, you've done that. such a good job. It would have had to have been ripped back. Doesn't it look marvellous? I've been really enjoying knitting these. I have. I really have. And you know, sort of making my peace with the fact that socks will never be my thing has been such a freeing experience mm. because it's enabled me to keep on. You know, what's happened now is that the, the fingering weight mittens might become the fingering weight project which keeps my small... I think small... that's a good idea. <laughs> She's so mean. <laughs> Look, I enjoy knitting socks every so often. <laughs> that's fine, isn't it? This is the Dumbrock though and I'm knitting these for our daughter Bridie which is nice because 
I can't remember why. Because she wants long socks oh, for her yeah. bother boots. Yes, which I'll talk about in finished things. Yes. Yeah, a bother boots. Can you remember? They were always called that, weren't they? Yes. Yeah, Bryony's got some yellow Doc Martens and they're cool. They're like a sort of mustardy colour. It's like they're actually the colour that's in the socks that I'll show you later. You need two eyes to the top. Hello. <laughs> My name's Mr Sock. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. It's like a fraggle. Oh, I used to love the Fraggles. Yeah, it's not it's, the same, is it? Well... Haven't they redone it and it's just not the same? Yeah, it's on Apple TV. It's a little bit weird. Yeah. I don't know. But to be fair, though, the big thing that used to live up on the island used to scare me a bit. You know, when you used to arrive yeah, at Front of yeah, the yeah. sometimes, there'd yeah, be yeah. a man in like, it a It just looked suit. different, I think. And the mu- they didn't have the music. They didn't have the Fraggle mo- Rock music, did they? The Fraggle Mock? Yeah, I know. I've got that wrong. I've not seen that show. <laughs> the music is everything, though, isn't it? It is. You died this... I did. Yes. What is it? It's the strawberry colour from the Pick Your Own Strawberry sock set that I did. From? Yeah, there was a spare Your first full season of My Favourite Colours. Was it? From last year. Right. Yes. Absolutely gorgeous. Loving Loving the sparkles. Yeah, very nice sparkles And to be fair, I've grown... Gold sparkles in that. You're lucky. Gold. Always believe in your soul. (sighs) I'm loving wearing sparkles myself, actually. Oh, I was on slightly those, those ones you wear and have got sparkles in. Yeah, yeah. Them. I was a bit concerned. I don't know why. Who's gonna know. look who's gonna look at your socks and say, Oh my word, they've got sparkles in? Nobody. Well then. And well that's something that I've grown to realise. And I just Embrace the sparkly socks. Well I do everyone, they're, they're that's fun. what I say. They're fun. Knit some sparkly socks. For your husband or your son. Yes. I the think best, they'll enjoy Actually, them. sparkles show up the best on like a dark coloured yarn. Like brown. Oh, now I want to dye up like a blue, like a midnight blue with gold sparkles in yes. it. That would be beautiful, wouldn't it? Yes. What else is on your needles? Right. Now I've nearly finished I'm these. loving the nail varnish today. Oh, well, I wasn't sure about this nail I varnish. I am sure about it. I think it. it makes me look like I've got old lady hands. No. Okay. I'm kind of trying to match it to my... That's why it works. Do I look like I've got old lady hands? No. I think I Oh. I feel like my hands are ageing. It's so oh, unbelievably look. wearing. <laughs> Your age has got nothing to do with this. Well, it did in my head. But no, no, you've always said things like this. Well, it's worse now that I'm old. <laughs> She's not old, is she? That's what everyone at home is saying. Yeah, I know. I think I'll feel They're a whole... I actually think I'll feel a whole lot better about the age thing once I hit 51. And I think once I get past that 50 thing... I think, you know, I think it will actually help me, yeah. as strange as it seems. Uh, I think it's just the 50, 50. Oh, loathe it. Look anyway. at these amazing anyway, socks. Anyway, anyway. These I'm socks. I'm almost finished with my Just Add Magic socks. So <sighs> these are a design in progress. The colour's amazing. Aren't they lovely? This was, was this the first yarn that you dyed up this season? Of yes. my favourite colourways? But look at the tiny speckles. Can you see all the tiny speckles? <gasps> or is it the one you've just done? Uh, I think it might be the one you've just done. Yes, sorry, it is the one I just did. Yes, yes, yes. Just yes. magic. Yes. Yes. Gorgeous tiny speckles. This sock hasn't been blocked yet. And this is what I was, I was going to say about DPNs. Oh, this, it hasn't been blocked yet, but look how tidy it is. Yeah. There's no kind of... Do you know what I think Um, it is? Or do you have a theory as to why it looks tidy? Tight stitches or anything. I I think I've just... I've just got used to working with a DPN and knowing how to swap from one needle to the next. If you think about it, though, on Magic Loop, your work is always sliding around your needles. It's pushing on and off needles. No, the reason the reason I get a tight stitch on Magic Loop is because that last needle drops onto the cable doesn't it or all your needles all your stitches are on the cable but when you pull on the yarn it's pulling on that last stitch or two and that to me is what causes the tight stitch but working on dpns your stitches are always on the dpn aren't they they never slide onto something that's thinner no so they don't slide anywhere no so they're they're always maintaining that same yeah 
attention. So don't get messed with. So all you've got to be sure is that you're getting it right when you switch from one needle to the next. And I, I've just now, you know, my technique now is it's such It's definitely that a harder just practice. technique. It's definitely a harder technique on DPS. But like all things. Practice, practice. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, just if you've never worked on DPS before, just cast on like, you know, half a number of stitches for a sock or something like I did with that swatch. Just knit a little tube and yeah. just practice and practice and practice. Change overs. Yeah. Yeah. You change overs and just getting that tension right. And I, you know, now I, like I say, I really, I love working on DPNs because I can get such a neat finish yeah. with it. But yeah, these are my Just Stud Magic socks. And as you can see, this is the right sock. Yeah. So this panel of lace will sit on the outside of your foot. And then my left I've sock... I've got to say, that lace looks tempting. It's a really lovely lace. The reason I like this is because it looks really vintage for me. Yeah. It looks like the sort of lace pattern that I would have had on school cardigans that my mum used to knit me. And in fact, I might have had one that had just like a panel of lace down the side of the button band. And it might have been a, a diamond lace. I'm not sure. But I just think it looks really vintage and classic. So yeah, this is my second one. You can see I am on the foot now. I think I've got three repeats left and I'll, I'll be on the toe. So I'm nearly done. I really powered through with this second sock because I just wanted to get it done and I've been so distracted with tons of other stuff that this was one of those things that just got neglected. And I shouldn't have done that because I really want to get this pattern out. So this is going to be so, a pattern available for people to buy at yes, some point? Yes, this will be my next... For, pur release. for purchase pattern, definitely. So I'm going to get the second sock finished over the next few days. I'm then going to write up the photographs. Obviously, yeah, I'll get them test knit and the pattern will be out as soon as I can get it out. So I just really love them and I've really enjoyed knitting them. Just having that panel to knit on, in my case, it sits easy, you know, just sits lovely over one DPN. And it would do that on all of the three sizes that's in the pattern if you distribute your, your stitches as I do. On DPNs I use, I distribute my stitches over four needles, like this. And then I knit with the fifth. And for me that also helps me with the tension on the changeover. I find that I struggle, if I've only got three needles holding my stitches I just find that I, I just struggle with getting the transition quite as neat as on four because I just feel like there's less tension over the you know over the join somehow but everybody's individual and everyone has their own way of knitting on DPNs I know this just works for me and I'm using these needles actually I I've managed to find some and order some more this morning, but these are Nitpick Sunstruck. So they're a birch needle. So imagine like the harmonies or symphonies we would call them, wouldn't we? The Nit Pro symphonies here. Why on earth? Do and I they think it's Nitpick Harmonies if I've got that the right way around. Why do they call them something different? I don't know. That seems insane, doesn't it? I don't know. One is European, one is American, isn't it? I'm not even but sure. It, Why don't you just call them? What would the reason be? All the same. <laughs> I, I don't know. But yeah, these are the Sunstruck, and they're basically birch. They're a birch like the harmonies or symphonies, but they're just not coloured. And I think these, for me, are the best, because... Even if you've, if you've got light yarn, if you've got dark yarn, you're never going to have a problem working with these needles. Whereas like the Symphonies, quite a dark needle. And if you had a, you know, a dark brown or navy blue or heaven forbid black, then I would struggle to see that, especially at night time on the dark needles. But they're just really hard to find. I was looking around for these this morning. Maybe they're easy in America, I'm not sure. But certainly in this country, I struggle to find them. I did find something that I'm not sure if it's the same. It was Knit Pro and they were called Basics. B-A-S-I-X, Birch, Basics Birch. And I think they looked the same, but I couldn't find the six inch length. They were all longer DPNs. But I did find some in Great British Yarns, which is a UK shop. So I ordered two pairs this morning because I just thought I really loved them and I really just want to have a couple. 
in my stash, you know, in case one ever breaks. I've I've actually never ever broken a wooden needle. So I know that lots of people say that they can't knit with wood because they just break, but I've never broken a wooden needle. So yeah, I really love these needles. So yeah, these two yarns are the Just Add Magic that we dyed up and then the pink that went with it. Somebody suggested that I call this Magician's Assistant and I really love that because we've got well, you could Just Add Magic. Debbie McGee. <laughs> Debbie McGee, yeah. We've got Just Add Magic and Magician's Assistant. I just really liked that. I thought that was lovely. So you can dye this yarn yourself in preparation for the pattern coming out if you wanted to knit it up. I really fancy... I mean, I, I love... You might get bored because there's only that one panel. Yeah. You like a bit more going on, don't you? I really I That really looks really cool, though. It's really nice to knit. Yeah. It is really nice to knit. And I, I really like it only being that one panel. Yeah, yeah. Because I can do that and then I just... Lovely, just stocking stitch now, background, next row work my panel lovely stocking stitch all the way around i, I think it's so it just gives you really a bit of everything nice. yeah i think yeah. so and it also means that you see lots of the lovely yarn so if you've got one of these gorgeous yarns and you really want to see the yarn it allows you to put a bit of pattern in but still see that yarn every time you work a stitch i think it's lovely so these will be done for next time, absolutely. And then I'll be able to give you progress on the pattern at that point Imminent well. new pattern release. Yes. Very exciting. And these are in one of my absolute favourite bags. I've shown this before and I keep looking in a shop thinking, oh, will she ever do this style of bag again? I really, I really love it. It's my patchwork halloween -y bag. Oh, I just love it. And it's got a circular bottom. I think it was Moo and Mouse is the shop that I bought this from and I do keep looking to see if she ever does one because it's one of my favourite, favourite bags and I just use it all year round. I don't care whether it's Halloween or not. Right, it's time for some comfort food. Yes, as I said earlier on in the show, Kay debuted a few episodes ago her brand new series Kay's Cozy Kitchen where she's sharing with you the secrets of how we keep ourselves fueled. Yes. And in the first show, it was all about the storeroom staples with the bread and the jam and the amazing pancakes. This time, though, it's time to get serious as she shares with you one of our favourite main meals. I love cake. But I've reached the point in my life where cake no longer likes me. What if I was to tell you that there is a solution? A way that we can eat delicious meals and still feel great afterwards. In this series, I'm going to show you how I do it and there won't just be puddings. There'll be retro dinners and storeroom staples too. This is going to be so much fun. So welcome to my cosy kitchen. Well, hello everybody and welcome back. I'm so thrilled to be here back in the kitchen and creating something very different to previous episodes of this and also previous episodes of our baking show that we've done before because today we are cooking a main meal. It's a perfect thing to have. All the family will like it. You know, I've never had a problem with any any sort of child not liking this. It always goes down really well. And also, you can make it in advance. So if you, you know, if you're at home through the day, you can make it whenever you want to make it. And then when you're ready to have your dinner in the evening, just pop it in the oven and you're away. So what are we going to be making today? Well... We are going to be making my own version of, I say that and it sounds very glamorous and it's really not, but it's just something that I've, you know, I've changed and tweaked and adapted over the years. But we're going to be making a cottage pie. Now I say cottage pie because it's made with beef. Shepherd's pie, a lot of people would say shepherd's pie regardless of whether it was beef or whether it was lamb, but actually technically a shepherd's pie would have minced lamb in it and a cottage pie has minced beef. Now we don't eat lamb, we don't um, cook with lamb at all, so we always make cottage, or I always make a cottage pie, which is the beef version. 
it's just one of our favourite family meals. But to go with the cottage pie, you've got to have some gravy. Now this is absolutely essential for me and it's something that I don't think generally you would find with a cottage pie recipe. It would just be the cottage pie and kind of the gravy is in within it in a way. But I always find it's either too dry underneath or it's kind of too sloppy and I sort of like that middle ground where it's nice and sort of stable <laughs> if you like and then I like to have the gravy separately sort of on the side so we will also be making gravy to go with it. So that's what we're going to be making today, delicious cottage pie. I've got my recipe book here all ready. Here's cottage pie. It's not really a recipe, it's just a list of my ingredients that I keep in here because the recipe is just sort of in my head. I just know how to do it because I've done it so many times. So cottage pie it is. So it's time now to have a look at exactly what we're going to need to make it. everything we're going to need. So starting over here, first of all we've got the beef mince. Now we always use the one that's really low fat, it's the lowest fat content that you can find. This is just 5% fat. I just, you know, I, I, we, we don't have beef very often, once a week at the most, so when we do have it we like to have the lowest fat. So I've got about a kilogram here of beef mince. We've then got our cheeses that we're going to use on top. I like to use a combination of cheeses and I'll tell you why when we get to that point. But I've got some cheddar underneath, some nice strong cheddar and some parmesan as well. And then we've got the vegetables. I've got a couple of carrots, nice big carrots and these are organic. I've got a couple of sticks of celery, two onions and then some mushrooms. I like chestnut mushrooms which is what these are. I find they have a really lovely flavour. We've then got some garlic over here and then here we've got fresh parsley. I use a combination of herbs. I like fresh parsley. I would never ever use dried parsley. I just don't think it, it's got any flavour. I find that some herbs dry really well and I think some herbs don't dry really well. This is entirely personal choice and it's really really up to you but I like to use fresh parsley and then I've got dried thyme. I think that thyme is one of the herbs that dries really well. We've then got some corn flour, we're going to use this right at the end just for some thickening some oil to cook our vegetables in, our potatoes there at the back. I've got, today I've got the Albert Bartlett Red Rooster potatoes. These are great, these are a brilliant all-round potato. They're great for jackets, they're great for mashing, roasting. It's just a really good all-round potato. Whatever potato you choose, you want something that's going to mash really well. So you want a floury potato. So you could use Mary's Pipers, you could use King Edwards, or in my case I've got the Red Roosters which are great. And then moving over there, I've got some salt at the back. I've got a tin of chopped tomatoes, really good quality chopped tomatoes. It's really, I find it's really worth paying extra for some good tomatoes, the flavour is so much better. And then some puree, tomato puree just on the top there. We've got two oxos, can you see oxo cubes down there? Oh, you'll see when I'm cooking the sauce. But yeah, two beef oxo cubes. Then Henderson's Relish. Now Henderson's Relish, it's a product from Sheffield actually, from my old hometown. If you can't get Henderson's then you can just replace that with Worcestershire sauce. I much prefer Henderson's to Worcestershire sauce but I appreciate that it's quite a local product and you might not be able to get it, whereas Worcestershire sauce you probably can get. So that's all of the ingredients and now it's time to look at what kitchen equipment we're going to need. We've got two saucepans, we've got a nice big saucepan here for cooking the filling in and I'll explain why I like a nice big saucepan as we go through it. And then I've got a medium sized pan here for the potatoes. This pan actually, I do get asked this quite often, you know, what are your favourite saucepans for cooking? This is my favourite, however, you can't get them any longer and I find, oh, I'm so, it's so frustrating. I bought this years ago, it's a Michelle Roux brand 
and it's by, it's Michelle Rue by Green Pan. And it's stainless steel, as far as I'm aware, I'm pretty sure it's stainless steel. And it does have a lid as well, which is over there. But this is the best pan I have ever, ever owned. And it cost, at the time, we bought this years ago, and I think it was about 60 or 70 pounds. It was a fortune, but let me tell you, it was worth every penny because it is the best pan. Nothing sticks, it washes brilliantly well, it, it just is fantastic. So that is definitely my favorite brand, but like I say, you know, if, if you can hunt around, you might be able to get them on eBay, I guess. And that's my favorite. And we've got, at the back here, I've got two dishes that I'm gonna be using today. The only reason I'm using two dishes is because I'm making, I'm splitting it into two. And you might want to do that as well, because you could pop one of these in the freezer after you've made it, you know, and have it the week after or whatever. But I'm gonna be doing a larger one for sort of family meal and then just a smaller one that I'm gonna be cooking today for us to try. So whatever dish you want to cook it in, you know, you might choose a really big one. If you've got a big family, you might just have a great big dish or you might do two, like I said, and freeze one for later. And then the only other things we're gonna need is a nice knife to do our chopping, wooden spoon for stirring. Okay, so that's everything we're gonna need and now it's time to get cooking. Ooh, yum, yum, yum. I could eat the gravy like a soup, in all honesty, because it's just so delicious. Right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make our filling. And I'm just gonna put in a few squirts of oil into the pan. I use a light olive oil, but it's entirely up to you. And I use this sort of squirty pump thing, which I just got on Amazon actually, because then you don't use a lot of oil. I don't, you know, you, you don't really don't need to use a lot of oil. Just a few squirts I find is fine. So I need to chop my onions. I've got two onions here, and these are just normal white onions. And some people would probably chop these in a particularly glamorous way. I don't do that, I just tend to chop the end off and then just peel them. I find really that there's no way of avoiding the teary eyes if you are prone to that. I find actually that now I don't wear contact lenses that I do sometimes get teary eyes because of onions. When I wore contact lenses, I never had a problem because they must block the fumes from your eyes. So I, I always used to think it was a myth because I never got teary eyes, but it was the contact lenses, I think, that were stopping it. So I'm just gonna peel it down. You want the, you don't want the sort of big Spanish onions. Well, we would call them Spanish onions, I think, in this country. But you want just, you know, your standard brown cooking onions. So I'm gonna leave the sort of end bit on there, the root, because that helps to keep the whole onion together if you just leave the root on at this stage. So I'm just gonna do the other one and then I can get rid of all the peely stuff and then we can just chop them. I'll just mention now and I'll just talk while I'm doing this about knives because I'm a bit weird when it comes to knives that I like to use and Dan always laughs at me because I like to use a little serrated knife. You can see it's got serrations like this one's a kitchen devil. And I use this for literally everything. I don't like really sharp knives. I'm a bit scared of them. I just prefer to use a serrated knife for literally everything. <laughs> but it's obviously up to you. But just in case you're wondering why I use a serrated knife, that is why. Okay, so we've now got our two onions peeled and I've also got two cloves of garlic here ready to go in. So I just need to get this chopped. So all I do, you don't have to worry about it being superly neatly chopped, the onion, or any of the vegetables, to be honest, because it's gonna cook for quite a long time, so everything's gonna cook down. So all I do is I chop them in half through that root section, and that just keeps everything together if you leave that root on. And then I just cut down, oops, and they might come apart like that, it's totally fine. Just cut into rough sort of sections, and I leave that back root bit out of it. And then I just turn and just chop. It just needs to be roughly chopped. It's totally fine like that. 
and actually because it's having quite a long cooking time it is better if it's if, if it's chunkier because otherwise it just goes down to a mush if it's too finely chopped you know I cut that back root section off and I don't use it because I find it, it it's like a little lump and I, just, I don't know I just like leaving that little root section out of the equation okay so that's the onions chopped I'm going to turn my heat on and then I'm just going to pile the onions into the pan it's always good to use more onions than you would think you need because onions really I find are the basis for pretty much every sort of savoury dish that you might make in one pan kind of thing you know stews, bolognese, um, cottage pie, anything like that and it, they will cook down. That's our onions in so turn up the heat and just get them starting to cook and then I'm going to grate in the garlic. I'm just using two cloves here we like garlic but I don't you know we don't like things to taste hugely of garlic so I find that two cloves is plenty again if you like a lot of garlic feel free to add more so I just grate it in because I find that the easiest method so just scrape that in and go inside the grater and get it all out so I'm just going to mix that in with the onions sort of starting to sizzle a little bit now now we don't want to brown the onions all we want to do is cook them until they start to go sort of translucent while that's cooking just keep an eye on them and if you feel you need a bit more oil then pop a little bit more in it just wants to be sizzling gently what I'm going to do while that's just cooking away the onions is I'm going to chop my carrots and my celery I've got two nice big carrots and two sticks of celery. Now, this again is just my own personal hang-ups, but I always peel my carrots. You might not want to peel them. Do whatever you want to do. These are lovely carrots, actually. Really carroty, if that makes sense. Sometimes you get carrots, especially in the supermarket, and they don't really taste like carrot at all. But these ones, you can smell the carrot, you know, when it, as you peel it, really lovely. So just keep an eye on your onions while you're chopping your vegetables. So what I'm going to do to chop these, it's fairly straightforward. I'm just going to chop them into quite chunky chunks. If you spend ages dicing things, it doesn't make a difference to your finished dish. And then I just grab a couple of pieces and chop them into four bits. So we've got quite nice chunky pieces. Can you see them? What I tend to do is I'm not using the carrots as the cat. I'm not using the carrots and the celery as like a vegetable as such. I'm using it more as a flavouring into the whole thing because I always serve cottage pie with the vegetables as well. So you might want broccoli or cabbage or you might want some more carrots. So I've now got the celery. So I just cut the top and bottom of this. I actually loathe celery <laughs> in its raw form. I can't stand it, but I really like it cooked in things. So that's great. What I'm doing now is I'm taking off the stringy bits. So all I do is I go to the top like that. And if you just sort of peel it back, you'll find that if there is any stringy bits, you might be lucky and not have any stringy bits, but I like to just peel them off. I'm going to now just drop my carrots into my onions as well, just to get them out of the way. So just drop those in, don't drop them on the floor. I'm now just going to chop the celery into chunks again like I did with the carrot. So I tend to sort of split them like that into three or four bits, depending on how big the celery is. And I think they say there's sort of like the holy trinity of, of sort of basic vegetables to put into dishes is onion, carrot and celery. Okay, dropping the celery in as well. Now you might at this stage be thinking, well it's a bit weird she's cooking the veg before she's even browned the mince, but this is just the way I do it. I like to get the vegetables started because these are the vegetables are the hardest bits you know that the meat cooks really in no time at all but the veg takes much longer so I'm just going to turn that up a little bit now 
So what I'm going to do now is just let this cook for about five, ten minutes at the most, just to start to soften the veg. Okay, that's just been cooking for a few minutes now, which is fine. You can see, oh, I don't know if you can see, but the onions are now starting to turn translucent and the veg has started to steam a little bit in the juices that are coming out. So now I'm going to add the beef. So all I'm going to do is just basically pile it in. This is a big... This is a big packet, so it's not very glamorous looking. And you always have to be careful because there's usually paper at the bottom, which there is. So I'm just gonna pile it all in and then get rid of the paper. <laughs> I know it looks a lot, and it is a lot, and this does make a big amount. So, you know, if you want a smaller amount, just half everything and, you know, make a smaller one. But I like to, we, we tend to, to do our cooking, all of our cooking this way, we sort of batch cook. And then we've got enough for two or even three meals, which is great so all I'm doing I, I don't like cottage pie when it has big chunk you know big lumps of meat I like it all to be really broken down so I'm just mashing it kind of with my wooden spoon because I want it all to break down and be quite a sort of fine mince I don't like I said I don't like it to have great big lumps of meat in it by starting the veg off first it just everything just amalgamates better into it and ultimately you know we're going to add liquid into this anyway and I don't think it really needs necessarily to be toasty brown so just keep turning it over until it's all turned effectively sort of brown colour. Okay, so you can see now that all that mince has browned nicely and it kind of starts to look like cottage pie filling. So now we're going to add in all the kind of flavoury things that I add in. Now some of these are fairly normal, some you might think, why is she doing that? That's a bit weird. But <laughs> this is just my method. So the first thing I'm going to do is add in two beef oxo cubes. Just because I think it adds tons of flavour, it gives a nice browning sort of colour to it. And it's just something I've always done for me it's it's a must-have ingredient into things like this so two oxo cubes I'm then going to add in some dried thyme oh, it's lovely thyme is one of the things I think that dries really well one of the herbs that dries really well but the thing I find with dried herbs is that you you never need as much as you would if you were using fresh herbs so if I was using fresh thyme I might need like a couple of tablespoons of it but that doesn't mean you need a couple of tablespoons of, fresh, of dried thyme it's much more concentrated because you dried it so I'm just going to sprinkle in I don't know What's that? That much? I do it by eye. It's probably about a teaspoon or so. I'm then going to put in my Hendersons. And again, I do this. I just put in a really good splash. I just go until I think I've put enough in. So I don't know. It's probably a couple of tablespoons. Henderson's is such a great product. If you can get it, I would really recommend it. It just adds a real savoury flavour. So now I'm going to add in a tin of chopped tomatoes. These ones are Syrio, which are really nice. So in they go. And then what I'm also now going to do is I'm going to fill my tin with water. And I'm going to add that in. And adding that water, this is what's going to start to produce our gravy. And I'll explain about that a bit later. So now I've got tomato puree. This is Syrio again. This is a really nice one. And we're going to put in about a tablespoon of tomato puree. This just adds a really nice richness. Just give that a stir through. And then the final thing we're going to add before we just let it have its sort of quite longish cook is the mushrooms. I'm just going to roughly chop them again. I'm not going to do this too precisely because mushrooms tend to cook down quite a lot. Just want to chop them enough so that it won't be noticed. So I've put in about sort of six or seven medium sized mushrooms. These are chestnut mushrooms. You use whatever mushrooms you want to and as many as you want to really. So you can see I've piled all the mushrooms in there. So I'm now just going to mix those through. And you can see we've got a lovely colour now to our filling. And I'm even going to add a little bit more liquid now. 
so that's like another half a tin because what this liquid is going to do this is what's going to form our gravy and you'll see how I do that when we get to that stage so that's everything in I'm now going to pop on a lid and I'm just going to let that cook away simmer away for really you know a good sort of 45 minutes so whilst this is cooking, we are going to prepare our potatoes. Okay, so I'm peeling my potatoes here and I've got, a, the, the bag of potatoes I've got is a two kilogram bag and I'll probably use most of them. I'm just going to see how many I can fit into the pan because I, I do like quite a lot of potato on top of shepherd's pie. Basically this medium sized pan that I've got here, I just get as many as I can in there. Okay, so I've rinsed my potatoes in cold water and I'm just gonna pop in some salt. And you, you might have noticed I didn't put any salt in our filling. And that's because the Oxos have a lot of salt in and the Hendersons also has salt in. So I, what I tend to do is once the, the sort of cooking process on this is finished, I'll taste it. And if I think it needs some salt, I'll add a bit more in at that point. So into my potatoes, I've got a kettle that I've just boiled here. So I've got some boiling water. This just speeds up the process. So boiling water and then heat on. And I do have a lid behind. So I'm just gonna, now the thing with potatoes is they do have a tendency to boil over, especially because I've got a huge pan full of potatoes. <laughs> so I'm just gonna pop the lid on just sort of half on like that. And just keep an eye on it. When it starts to boil, I'm gonna turn it down and just leave the lid sort of partially on. And they'll need to boil for maybe 20, 25 minutes, just until they're tender, until a knife goes in and they're nice and soft. Okay, so everything is now cooking. We've made our cottage pie filling, which is cooking away, and our potatoes are now boiling happily away as well. So come back in part two. We will mash those potatoes, and then by the time we've done all that, the filling will be ready to go as well, and we can start to put our cottage pie together, and then of course, we're gonna make that gravy. So I'll see you back soon. Now you're talking, young lady. Spelt and homemade jam might be the perfect sort of snack between meals, but the thing that keeps me going through the day is Kay's cottage pie. Cottage pie. Oh yes, my goodness. You're only boiling your potatoes and boiling your sauce and already my tummy's rumbling. <laughs> It is, it's the smells, isn't it? That's what gets you every time. Yes. The really funny thing actually is, when you were making that sauce, it reminded me, my mum used to make when, like, in the early 80s. Mm. It was the first curry that I ever had. What made you think of that? Because it was mince and onions. Right. And carrots. And then she just used to stir through garam masala. Oh, gosh. And right. serve it with rice. Right. So basically, it was mince and onions. Curried mince. Mm. It wasn't nice. <laughs> I mean, to be fair at the time... I don't like curry, so I wouldn't like it. To be fair at the time, we didn't know any different. So it was always Well, no, sort of it wasn't. It had only just emerged, really, hadn't it? Yeah. Hey, now, <laughs> did you notice in the first episode of Kay's Cozy Kitchen... I mean, to be fair, you haven't tried this yet. But <laughs> when she tried the bread and jam... <laughs> Oh, I had a big lump of jam on my face. I said to Dan, oh my word, why didn't you tell me I had a big lump of jam on my face? He said, oh, I thought it would be funny. Well, I said, well, it wasn't funny. No, no, that, that's not true. I didn't see it. I don't recall seeing it at the time. Mm -hmm. I may maybe, have thought it was maybe funny Maybe no one afterwards. else noticed it and I've just drawn everybody's attention to it now, the fact that I had jam all over my face. It was very funny. We've just finished, actually, the first pot of that jam. Yes. Literally, this morning, just finished it, and we just started on the second one. It's been delicious. Well, it's always delicious. That jam is to die for, and it's so straightforward Ooh, to Oh, and make. I used it. I used it to make... They were gorgeous. Um, what are they called? I think they're called raspberry buns. I used to make them when I was at primary school. Yeah, it's the, it's like a scone, basically, and then you stick your thumb in it and make a hole, and then you put a bit of jam in it, and then you, like, close the hole back up again. 
And I made those the other day and they were delicious. With spelt flour, of course. But look, mm. we're making cottage pie. Yes. And we're going to find out how it's finished off and what it tastes like later on in the show. Yummy. So to get there... I need to ask, Kay Jones, what's off your needles? I do have some things, some very exciting things, actually. One of them, well, they're all exciting. Yes. One of them's very exciting. The first thing I've finished is Bryony's stripy socks. I think I showed these last time, didn't I? And I've finished them. Yay, so they're all washed and blocked and finished. Look at those lovelies. To go with their boots. Yes, so these are to wear with her yellow Doc Martens and it's this sort of yellow it's like a yeah it's like a sort of mustardy egg yolk no it's not egg yolk that's a bit too orange but yeah it's this sort of a yellow it's really nice and she has worn them we, I was a bit dubious about her wanting Doc Martens because she's not used to wearing boots around her ankle and I thought oh will she like these but we went to the cinema and she wore them the whole time and just said they were great I think because she loves the concept of them so much she's putting up with the breaking in process so we've both said to her, you've got to break them in, you know, because it's quite stiff leather. But once you've broken them in, that will be it. They'll be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so these will be for her Doc Martins. And the yarn I used was London House Yarns in a, a little sock set, self-striping with the yellow mini. And it, the sock set is called Grello London House Yarns. And I'm sure I've got enough here, actually, to make some fingerless mitts for her with this yellow as a contrast. So I'm going to keep hold of that, and um, at some point I'll make her some fingerless mitts. But I used... Wear her socks and her shoes and her mitts. I know. She does like to coordinate. I wonder where she gets that from. So, yeah, I just did top down, 64 stitches. I did a nice long leg, which is what she wanted. I put in my butterfly heel, which is in my lattice top socks. So this heel, it looks like a short row heel, but it's not. You don't work it the same as a short row heel. I, I love it. This is my favourite type of heel for, you know, self-striping yarn where you don't want to interfere with the stripes. Um, and I would, to be honest, I'd, I'd put it into any sock because it, it just made the process so quick as well. I just, I felt like I knit these much quicker because the heel is nice and quick to knit and then it's just all knitting. And I find found that I could just whip around sort of 10 rows really quite quickly. So they grew really nice, you know, nice and quick. And I managed to match them really well. You know, the toes match sort of perfectly and the cuffs match. So yeah, they're all done and she can have those today, so she'll be thrilled. Cool. That's the first thing. So the second thing is I finished my pixie dust cowl. Amazing. Yes. Now, here it is in all its glory. So this cowl was knit using an advent calendar of minis from um, Pixie Yarn. So I designed this and I've used the minis. This is what I've got, I say left over, but there's tons. It uses about eight grams of a 20 gram mini. I, I deliberately designed it that way because I wanted people to be able to knit this with either a 10 gram set of minis or a 20 gram. And if you've got 20 grams like me, I've just got lots of lovely leftovers to do with whatever you want, blankets, scrappy socks, whatever. So yeah, I did use all 24 minis, even though, I mean, it has come out long and I'll pop it on because even though it's long, not a problem. I think it looks great. So I think, because when I showed it on, in our Facebook group, it was like, oh, that looks really long. I wonder if it'll be too long for a cowl. It absolutely isn't. It's perfect. It's just really lovely and snuggly and it's just perfect. You know, I, I would happily wear this all day. I mean, that is absolutely and perfect. It's, yeah, it's gorgeous. I think it's because the lace enables it to sort of it just, they just sit down nicely down. on itself. Yeah, I mean, this sort of a cowl, you can knit really long because they do just scrunch down really nicely. Yeah. So if, you know, if, you, if you're worried about it being too long, I mean, for, for starters, if you're worried about it being too long, you can either just... I will put something in the pattern to tell you how to knit it shorter. But basically, you just do two repeats of the pattern instead of three. Yeah. Because I've done three repeats in each colour. The question you should be asking yourself, though, is do you like snuggly cows? Yeah. Or do you not like snuggly cows? And to be honest, if you like wearing a cowl around your neck, 
I'd be surprised if you didn't like a snuggly cow. Well, yeah. In the yeah, right I, yard. I agree. I agree. So but I, just knit it and. Yeah, I, you know, there's absolutely no issues for me in, in knitting it this length. And. You design things the way you like them, don't you? Yeah, yeah. and that is, that is true. So it is longer than my normal cows, but I, I absolutely love it and I will wear this a ton. I'm not going to wear it yet because I need to photograph it, so I just need to keep it all lovely for the photos. But yeah, this was an advent calendar that I purchased last December from Pixie Yarns, and I think actually she still might have some in her shop. I think she was selling them at a discount the last time I looked, so it is worth going and have a look, having a look. And I think she's dyed up some full skeins of some of the colours as well, some of the ones that were favourites. So yeah, this this will be a design. This actually will be my next platinum design. So it'll be going out to our patrons on the 1st of June, so it's the next one. So it's gold and platinum patrons that get access yes. to the 2022 platinum collection? Yeah, and although this is, it uses an advent calendar of yarns and June is obviously not very Christmassy, I know that a lot of people like doing the Christmas in July sort of knit along thing. So you could absolutely knit one then. Uh, but I'll also, uh, the feedback that I got when I said I was going to release it later in the year was, oh no, don't do that, because I've got an advent calendar of yarns and I would love to use it now. So And also, it doesn't look Christmassy. No, and look, you don't have to use an advent calendar. You can just use leftovers. Like I said, you only need about eight, nine grams. But that was a so, Christmas advent calendar, wasn't it? It was. And it doesn't look Christmassy. No, no. So, no, but a lot of advent calendars don't look Christmassy as no. such. So why it's should just you need a Christmas, to knit them Well, it's Christmas. a Christmas concept. People like knitting them right. through December. Right. Whenever I talk about my platinum designs, I do get questions, and honestly, some of them are quite upset that they can't purchase the pattern. And all I would say really is give it a go. You know, you, when you sign up to be a patron, you're not signing up forever. You can cancel it whenever you want to cancel it. The bottom so, line is you could, when this gets released, yeah. for $10, become a patron for one month, yeah. get access to this pattern, yeah. plus get access to the Cape Cod hat free, plus get access to the... Tutorials. No, 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 um, the, the, the Christmas design. Yes. What was that one called? Christmas in the Big Woods? Yeah, yeah. So this would have been on sale for $5? No, £4.75 I sell my patterns for. So you yeah, would... Well, how many dollars is that? Uh, it's more than $5. Yes, it so is. Six, for, maybe. So for $10... So four dollars more, yeah. you're getting three you would patterns, get three patterns instead of one. But also, you would get access to all of my tutorials. You, you know, you could watch some well, pops. Hold you, on a minute. You could really just have a look around and see. You if also get access to the Knitting University, which is six exclusive patterns. Yeah, with yeah, accompanying yeah. tutorials. So I, yeah, I guess my point is, you know, for ten dollars, just try it for that month. Have a look around, join in with, you know, everything that we do. And then if it's not for you, Cancel. you don't have to continue with it. <laughs> so then um, you've got the pattern. Yeah. Other patterns. But at least then you will have experienced what it's like to be part of our little community. And, it, you know, you might think that it's it's very good value for money and you're going to carry on. And, you know, you got something out of it. So I do always want to do my best work for my platinum designs. I always do my best work. <laughs> But I don't ever want the platinum collection to be like an af not an af even an afterthought. Yeah, yeah you, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You know, my platinum collection, I'm really proud of it, and it's all designs that stand on their own two legs, you know. And this just cried out for, for me, it was just like, yeah, this is a great addition to my platinum collection. There's nothing in there like this. It's designed for an advent calendar, so having that in there I think is a brilliant addition. But yeah. when, all, when it's all said and done, how many, I mean, how many patterns do you have available in your Ravelry store? Oh, 70-ish, <laughs> something like that. So, yeah. and I think there's 16 platinum patterns? Yeah. So yeah. 17, um, maybe 18 platinum patterns. So the 70 patterns, so the majority of Kay's designs yeah. are available absolutely. for you to buy. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. please don't send... Okay. Yeah, upset it, messages. It, yeah, without yeah, our patrons, yeah. we wouldn't be here doing anything. Yeah, please don't. They wouldn't be designing. <laughs> you know, we, no, we just wouldn't be here. True. It's absolutely true. Yeah, we wouldn't be here for everybody to watch. 
if, and by if it wasn't. Too. And by parts, you know, we wouldn't be doing anything of what we do we do now. We'd we'd just be out in the world with normal jobs because that's what we would have had to have done. So yeah. What else? The last thing, right now, I've got to be careful how I show this. Yeah, you can't see all of it. You can't see all of it, sadly. But I made a bag yesterday. I made a project bag. I told her not to. Let me tell. Well, actually, it took me two days to make this because it was such a complicated make for me. Not but to the, be fair, not the bag itself. You've done a good job because you're not like saying you're in pain today. So. No, I'm all right. I have to be careful when I sew because it's not so much the sewing; it's the cutting out. Do you know, sort of leaning over, and you know, with the cutting thing. What's it called? You know what I mean. It doesn't matter. Yeah, but the cutting out is the thing that does my back in. Um, but I, it took me two days to do it and I, you know, I made a project bag and I absolutely love it. Now, I can only show you the back because... The front side is actually the really cool bit. <laughs> yes, because the front contains a panel of something that is... You first spoke about in yes. our pop show, which came out the other Sunday. I did, so I can tell you all now what it is. But yeah, in our last pop show, I, I told everybody that I designed a new series that was coming this summer. And this took the place of what we've done the last two years has been the Knitty You. And we did that as a way of helping people get through the sort of lockdown situation. Fingers crossed we're now sort of coming out of that. But I want I still wanted to do something over the summer. Something special. Something special. So I thought of something brand new and I've designed this series and I've worked all the way through it myself one whole time. So I know that I'm confident now in sort of in presenting it and, it and is doing something it. Totally new. It's something completely new and it's a instead of the knitty you, I've called it the stitchy you because it's an a hand embroidery series. So over, it'll probably be July and August, maybe June and July, but more likely July and August this year. I'll be running a series of videos, you know, showing you all and hopefully all of our patrons will join in in creating your own little hand embroidered Thing. design. <laughs> now, I can't, you know, I'm being careful what I say because I've actually designed this thing. I did the artwork, I came up with the concept, I did the artwork myself and I've stitched my way through a whole one and I'm going to stitch my way through another one during the series Just um, and I'll also do some separate videos showing all of the stitches separately that we're so going to do. So perfect for complete beginners. Yeah and I'm, I was a complete be beginner, I'd never done it before and I think coming from that standpoint that I'd never done it before. I think that's a good place to be because then I'm teaching it from, you know, the standpoint of being a complete beginner and now having a little bit of experience just showing you how I went about all those things. And, you know, what I've produced I'm really pleased with and I'm really happy that it looks pretty good. But what I decided to do was to add it so I could show it actually made into something I thought I'll make a project bag and I'll incorporate it into a project bag so that's what I've done but this is the back of the bag so what I've done is is patchwork there's a lot more patchwork on the other side and then the actual embroidered panel is incorporated within the patchwork but I wanted to add in a bit of the patchwork up here you can see one of these I've sewn it upside down the pumpkin's head is upside down let me tell you, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of sewing little patchwork squares. I actually bought, I think they're called mini charm squares. Yeah, mini charm squares. And they're two and a half inch squares. I bought a little set of them. You get 42 squares. And the one that I use, so this that you can see here, this fabric coordinates with it. This is from the range. It's called Kitty Corn from Moda. So that's the range that I used. And it's like a Halloween-y, autumn -y themed range. And yeah, so that's what I used. And then the lining is, is something different. This actually contains a design, so I don't want to show you the inside either. Lots of secrets, I know. But yeah, I, I wanted to show you so that I could talk about the hand embroidery course that we're going to be running. Just in case any of our patrons didn't see that pop show, you might be watching now and you didn't know. Um, or anybody new that might want to, to come and join you know, become a patron and then join in with it. So yeah, the patchwork honestly was a nightmare. Even though these squares were pre-cut and if anybody's used these, they have like a pinking sheared edge and I lined them up really carefully. On this side, one of the squares on this end here is, is off by 
probably a quarter of an inch. By the time I got over to this side, it was off. And I, I was like, why is this, why is this? And I, I started measuring all the little squares and I did find that some of them weren't quite square. So I can only think it's that, or it's just my inexperience and maybe my seam allowance was a little bit different on a couple of them and then that caused a knock on. But then that, you know, it's very difficult getting them all kind of lined up like that. And there is a bit of that on the other side. But yeah, it's a great size bag. I did a nice big one and I love all the fabrics. I put a little handle on it that I made using some of the tiny squares. It's got this gorgeous peach coloured zip. Beautiful. Yeah. Look, so. my tummy's rumbling. So I think it's time we got back to the cosy kitchen to finish off and try, hopefully she won't get any on her chin, a <laughs> delicious cottage pie. <laughs> to Kay's Cozy Kitchen and our construction of our cottage pie. So the potatoes are now cooked, our filling has had a nice long simmer away so we're all ready now to get on with the final stage which means mashing the potatoes and I'll show you just how exactly I do that, quite old fashioned no surprise and then we're going to put everything together and get it in the oven. Okay so we have got here now our filling has had about, you know, for 30, 40 minutes cooking. And you can see how it's just, everything has cooked down now, but you can still see those chunks of vegetables and that's why we chopped them nice and sort of, you know, a good little chunk on them. So they didn't all just disintegrate in. And we've got lots of liquid. That's just how we want it. So that's ready. Our, our potatoes are cooked and I've drained them and they've just been letting the steam come off just for a few minutes. I always do this with mashed potatoes because the, the way that I find it, I get a really nice fluffy mash is if you just let them steam for a few minutes because that gets rid of a bit of the moisture and it just leaves a sort of nice fluffy potato in there. So these are ready to mash now and I did taste my mixture and I did just add in a bit of salt. I always use sea salt flakes, it's really the best salt. I never use the kind of commercially produced salt, I always use natural salt. It's so much better for your body and it's so much, you know, it tastes so much better. So we're going to mash our potatoes, so I'm just going to bring them over here. Now, I'm gonna add some butter. I don't put a lot in because, you know, we are careful with the amount of butter that we use, but there is a lot of potatoes here, so I'm just gonna add a knob, a big knob. Put in as much as you want to. And then I'm also just gonna pop in a bit of seasoning, so a bit of salt. I'm not, you probably noticed as well that I haven't used any pepper in anything. Now. This is quite unusual, I realise, but I loathe pepper the same way that I loathe celery. But I can deal with celery when it's cooked, I cannot deal with pepper at all. So <laughs> I don't use pepper, but obviously please feel free to put pepper in if you wish. So I'm going to mash them now. I use an old fashioned potato masher, one of these manual ones that I've had for donkey's years. I've seen people mashing potatoes in various different ways. I've even seen people using like electric beaters to mash potatoes, which, you know, as someone that's just always used this method, it seems a bit strange to me. But I've always just preferred using an old fashioned potato masher and just getting in there and using a bit of elbow grease. So I just kind of start off gently. I've got a lot of potato in here. I don't normally use, you know, I'd, if I'm doing mashed potatoes with something, I don't normally have this many mashed potatoes in a pan. But we're, ma we're making a big quantity, you know, so we needed a lot. So that butter is just melting as I'm mashing. And I might find, and I think I probably will need, just a little bit of milk. I don't put that in at the beginning because... I find that you never really know how potato potatoes are going to behave. Sometimes you get a batch and, you know, they just don't seem to need as much milk. And sometimes you get some like these are nice and dry and flowery. Can you see how sort of fluffy and flowery they are? So it will take a little bit of milk. So I probably will add in just a touch of milk. 
but I don't want my potatoes to be really sloppy. I want them to be quite firm because they're going to sit on top of that mixture. And the last thing we want is for the potatoes to sort of merge into the filling if they're too sloppy. So now I've sort of mashed these a little bit, I'm just going to get some milk out of the fridge and just add in a splash. We happen to have a pint of whole milk in the fridge because Dan likes to use this sometimes for his coffees. So I'm going to put in a splash of whole milk, which is sort of full fat milk. But normally I would use semi-skimmed, but we just happen to have that. So so I just put in a little splash, you saw. And I find that that then just makes them a little bit more creamy. So I'm just going to keep going till I've sort of mixed that milk through and then I give them quite a sort of bashing. And this is a bit more tricky because my pan is full, but basically I just go in, I sort of change my grip to like this and I just give them a real good, you know, get your energy, not your energy, get your anger out, you know, if you're annoyed about something get in and mash some potatoes so in and then just and yes it takes a bit more energy than doing it with I don't know how you would do it apart from this but with the, you know maybe like I say some a beater or something I'm not even sure because I've just always done potatoes like this so I just do that a few times you know, dis redistribute the potatoes around and then give them another good old beating. And it really does make them creamy and fluffy. And all right, you might get the odd tiny lump, but honestly, we've never had a problem having mash like this. Right, perfect. I want those potatoes to cool down a little bit. Okay, so that's just having a minute to cool off and I'm just gonna chop my parsley and pop it into the filling. So I've got, I don't know, what's this? A good handful you can see here of, this is flat leaf parsley. You can use the curly type if you want. And I just go through it and just take out any stalks that are really thick. I don't mind the sort of thinner stalks, but the thicker stalks, I don't really want those. So I'm just gonna chop all this kind of roughly. And putting it in at the last minute keeps that, I find it keeps that sort of freshness more. If I'd have put this in right at the beginning, it just cooks down to nothing and I don't think really adds that much. When it's fresh herbs, I think they should stay as fresh as possible. That'll be fine. Smells lovely. Fresh parsley smells lovely. So that'll be fine. So I'm just going to drop that into our filling and just stir that through. So, what I'm gonna do now is bring this over. So I've got my two dishes here that I'm using. As I said before, you might just have one big dish or you might like may have two smaller dishes. And I'm just going to, using a slotted spoon, I'm going to pop the mixture into the dishes. So as I take it out, I'm just gonna drain off the sauce or gravy, whatever we're going to call it, let's call it gravy. I am going to add some back in, but at this stage we want to just drain it off and pop our filling in. So I've got a couple of scoops in there and see how much we need in the large one. And the smaller one, this is the one I'm going to cook now, so I've popped that onto a baking tray. With anything like this where it has the possibility of sort of bubbling over, I always put it onto a baking tray because then if it bubbles over, it goes onto the tray and not onto the bottom of your oven, which can be a pain to get off. So I'm just gonna carry on scooping this out and sort of draining it through my slotted spoon. You can see you do get some gravy coming out, which is fine, because we don't want this completely dry. And it's fine if this, you know, this just takes a couple of minutes to do, but that's fine because it just allows your mixture to cool off a bit, which is what we want. You could sort of pour all this through a colander with a bowl underneath. I have done that before as well. That's much quicker doing it that way so that then all the juice catches underneath, all the gravy sort of catches underneath. 
it does mean more washing up, which is the only reason I haven't done it today. So this takes a little bit longer, but does the same job. Okay, so the filling is now in our dishes. Potatoes are just cooling a little bit more. So now we're gonna make the gravy. We've got the fillings here in our dishes and this is the gravy that was within the filling. So I'm gonna thicken this a little bit and then I am gonna put a bit of this back into the filling and then the remainder will be our gravy to eat it with. So what I've got here is some corn flour and I'm going to take about a sort of big teaspoon maybe a couple of teaspoons yeah and I'm just going to mix this with cold water you must never ever mix up corn flour with hot either liquids or water it's always got to be cold so a bit of cold water into there and then just stir it to make a I don't know what it is what is it it's sort of a little white sauce I suppose so I've got my gravy in a small pan here and I'm just heating it up. So you can see it's still hot and that's what we want. Now we don't want this to be boiling when we add in the corn flour, it just needs to be hot. So I'm going to pour in a bit of the corn flour, go steady. And just let that heat through, just keep stirring it a little bit and just let that heat through and you need to heat it until it starts to uh, simmer because that's at the point you'll be able to tell how thick it is from the corn flour because it will thicken as it heats through. So we'll probably need to add a bit more but let's just see what that gives us. And we just want this to be you know as thick as I suppose as thick as you like your gravy it's really up to you you can imagine this gravy has got all of the flavor of the cottage pie filling it's got all of the flavors in there it's really delicious and it's really what makes it for us having this extra gravy to pour on top so I'm just going to let that come up to simmering okay so our gravy is just the right thickness now and what I'm going to do is just add a little bit back into the filling because we don't want it really dry that'll be fine and now we've got a whole pan of gravy which you can just let this go cold be fine and you can just reheat it whenever you need it so that's our gravy done so now all that's left to do we just need to pop on our potatoes and then some cheese so my oven is preheating at the moment to about 180 degrees fan 180 degrees C that is and our potato now has cooled off a little bit which is good so we're going to pop it on top now this is how I do it I go into each corner first so I put a blob in each corner and spread it out. I find that if you put it straight in the middle it can cause the, the the gravy that's in there to sort of splurge up the sides whereas if you start in the corners and then work your way round I find that better so I'm going to go to this one now and what I'm actually going to do is this large one I'm setting aside at this stage once I've got the potato on top and this one can be cooked later for a main meal or you could even freeze it if you wanted to or you could pop it in the fridge if you wanted to do it tomorrow for example and then I'm going to be cooking this smaller one so can, you can see I put some on the side then and just spread it along there we go so you could leave it like that if you wanted to the sort of rough look I tend to sort of go along and just make a little pattern with my spoon and this produces little sort of valleys where the cheese can live and go all lovely and crinkly so this back one I'm gonna just let it cool completely and I'll pop it in the fridge once it's completely cool and I will put the cheese on top just before that one is baked. This one is the one we're gonna bake now so we need to add our cheese on top. Okay, so I've got two sorts of cheese. I've got cheddar and I've got some Parmesan. So the first thing I'm gonna do is put some cheddar on. I just grate it straight on top in a pile and then sort of move it around. So just grate as much as you think you want and then move that around. 
that looks enough to me. So that's the cheddar and now I add in a little bit of parmesan. So I'll go to the finer side of my grater for the parmesan and just do this sort of all over. And it just increases that kind of savoury flavour. So again, just move that around and we're done. So now we can pop this into our oven for about 30 minutes, I would say. You, as soon as it's, you start to see it kind of bubbling up on the edges, it'll be done. Once it's had its 30 minutes, we can take it out and we can try it. So here we go. It's piping hot. Delicious. Oh, I should have really put a cloth on my hand, shouldn't I? But <laughs> manage there we go oh look at that so I would actually serve this when I was serving it as a, a main meal I would serve it with any sort of green veg we'll add on some of our delicious gravy so it's finally time to try our delicious cottage pie oh it looks so yummy you know it, it it's something that takes a little bit of planning and a little bit of cooking, but honestly, it's really, really worth it. So should we try it? Especially with the gravy. The gravy is essential. Mmm. Oh. It's honestly, it's the ultimate comfort food. It's so delicious. It's, I think it's because it's one of those things that I grew up with and I'm sure if you're in this country and probably in lots of other countries it's something that you grew up with so it always feels really comforting when we have it and it's delicious the cheese on top is just brilliant because you get that little bit of a sort of crust and that extra bit of savoury taste to it it's really yummy and honestly the gravy I could eat the gravy like a soup in all honesty because it's just so delicious it literally is the most perfect comfort food, especially on a day like today when it's a bit grey, a bit overcast and really quite chilly still. So it's just a fantastic thing to come home to when you've been, you know, kids have been at school, you've all been out working and you've got this ready to eat. Just absolutely delicious. So I really hope you enjoy it. So that's the end of another fantastic Kay's Cozy Kitchen. I will see you back next time. Who knows what we'll be making then, but I'm sure it will be delicious. So I'll see you back soon. Folks, that is most definitely one of our trade secrets. Yes? Oh, it's yummy. If you want to gorge yourself on something and then head out into the wilderness for an adventure, that's the tea for you. Oh, yes. I wouldn't advise anybody to gorge themselves. <laughs> Look, you may be a gorger, like me. When I find something I like, I want to eat lots of it. Yeah, but you can't gorge anymore. You used to eat a lot more food than you do now. I do, yeah. but I still had two portions. He did have two. With extra two cabbage. Por- with extra ca- <laughs> Yeah, we had it with cabbage and... Was it just... No, cabbage and sweet corn, I think we had in the end, actually. Yeah. Yes. Now, Kay's Cozy Kitchen will be back on the 6th of May. Yes. Next time, we will most definitely yes. be walking the wall. Yes. Let me tell you, I, I'm beyond excited. Yeah. And that was the thing that I said to you yeah, when I got back. Yeah, I know. Back. It was really frustrated was like, because he saw the location and saw how good it's going to be. Like, and he was like, oh, I just wanted to do it. I said, yeah, but you know, you'll just be frustrated because... You, you, if you can't do your best work because of something, then it, you would have just been frustrated with yeah. the whole thing. So I've fudged stuff before, you yeah. know, when it's rained. We've had walks before, and I can always pull together something which yeah, looks and, great. You know, getting rain on the camera and all of that business, it's just... This, though, know. this series, Hadrian's Wall, it, we both feel the same. When we go there, we mm. just feel at home. We do. And we this do. spot, when I got yeah. out of the car, I was like... Oh my goodness. Yeah. I was seeing things that I... Now, I've been visiting Hadrian's Wall for a long time. And I'll be showing you things I'd not even ever seen before. Not up close. Not looking straight at. It's beyond gorgeous. So, all I can say is this. Bring on spring and bring on the wall. <laughs> bring on the wall. Do you remember that? <laughs> that was Dale Winton. And then oh, it, it was, was Anton Dubeck. Anton Dubeck used to do it, yeah. Yes. It was yeah. a dreadful show. It wasn't very good, no. <laughs> it wasn't very good. But folks, <laughs> right now, it's time for the Andy Bits. What have you purchased? I've bought a couple of things. Wonderful. Show us. Now, the first thing, 
much excitement, and I don't know if Opal lovers out there will know this, I didn't, but Opal have resurrected their Van Gogh range, Opal Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh. They did this range, gosh, it's a good few years ago now, and Dan's got a few pairs of socks that I made him out of this, and they discontinued it and you couldn't get it anymore. And I think I do still have one skein in my stash. But I was on, I was looking for something else. I think I ordered a needle and I just happened to see it in the new yarns. I just clicked on new yarns and saw it. I was like, what? And I just thought, I, I thought to myself, Am I imagining this? Have they always done it or have they brought it back? But it is, I'm, I'm certain it is new and they brought it back. So I bought two skeins of the Opal Vincent van Gogh range, these two shades. So the greeny one is 5434 and the blue one is 5435. And I got these from Woolstack in the UK. You can get them from Wool Warehouse and in all honesty, I'm, I kind of feel like I made a mistake buying them from Woolstack because I forgot that Woolstack like to vacuum pack their yarns when they post them. Now, I can understand why they do this because they fit through a letterbox and it's cheaper postage. I absolutely understand that. However, you know, both of these skeins, the, can, you, can you see on the ball band how creased it is and marked the ball band is it's like it's been dragged through a hedge backwards it kind of does and they're both like that and i know it's just the ball band and i know people will say it's better to to do what they they do but yarn is precious isn't it and you get it through the post and i've just bought it and i don't want it to look like i've had it in my stash for 10 years yeah, and that's, that's, what it looks like. that's kind of what it looks like yeah. and i just don't like the idea of my yarn being flattened like that somehow i know it's not doing it any damage this is just me my personally so you know if i was going to go back and buy this again i would buy it from wool warehouse because they they don't do that they don't vacuum pack it I just don't like that and I wouldn't buy from Woolstack, again, yarn-wise. They don't do it with everything, you know, if you bought a huge amount, I can't imagine they would vacuum pack that. I think they do it more when it's like this, for example, one or two balls of commercial sock yarn, And because I've, I've had them arrive that way be before and I realised when it came through the door, I was like, oh, I wish I'd ordered it from Wool Warehouse. But yeah, get yourself some Opal Van Gogh if that's your thing whilst it's there, because I'm sure they'll discontinue it again. And then the other thing is, I saw this shop, I think it came up as like a suggestion on Instagram, do you know how you get those things? And it just jumped out at me, this yarn, so I went and investigated it, and it actually made me to purchase, it actually caused me to purchase a skein, which adverts on, on Instagram, I don't normally get involved in at all, I just, don't look at but this was definitely an exception and it's a skein of yarn from Mariantha Yarns she's a dyer in Europe I think it's Germany Mariantha Yarns and this colorway is Mikado can you see the speckles I, I wonder why she's called it that Mikado I don't know that's a Gilbert and Sullivan music yeah yeah can you see the speckles it's these teeny tiny little specks. I've honestly never seen speckling like this. It kind of looks like she's got a Sharpie marker and done that on the yarn, which I know she won't have. Because that would take hours. <laughs> well, it would take hours and it's completely <laughs> impractical, but I, I just, it, it's like an enigma to me. Is that the right word? Yeah. I, I just don't know how she's done this. And it is, I just think it's intriguing. I think it's going to make a fantastic pair of socks. It's on the base that I really like. It's 85.15. And it came really quickly. The service was really good. Beautiful. So, you know, when I get to knit this up, I will show you. But it's just, I mean, it's just amazing. Those teeny tiny specks, aren't they? I just wanted to show you how fantastic that is. It's going to be fun to knit, I think. We've recently published our latest pop show, which yeah. you can watch here. In our pop show, we updated you on our Great British Coastal Challenge. Yes. The walk and the run is, of course, open to everyone. If you want to come and get involved, full details are in the show notes. And the newest team is called Giggleswick, and it's just 
it makes me think of Justin Fletcher and Gigglebiz. Oh, it's dang, just yeah. filling up now with lots of amazing team members. It's filling up fast, actually, which is really exciting. And, of course, the year-long patron uh, knit-along is also ongoing as well. And, we, uh, Kay, you updated everyone as well on that yes, pop show. Yes. Speaking of the pop show, I'm delighted and very excited to confirm that the composer of the majority of our music will be joining us in either... It's just a case of his diary. He thinks probably April, but maybe May. I'll be able to confirm exactly when my brother Dom, who composes the majority of our music, so he's really been part of the team mm. for years now, he will be joining us for a 10-minute interview. So Much excitement. You all get to meet. Dom's lovely. Yes. Yeah. You'll, you'll be able to... What I'll do is we'll talk about it in the March show because I think what we'll say is that you could submit questions pre-interview mm. because otherwise I think it might become yeah. a bit of a free-for-all because yeah. I would yeah. guess lots of yeah. people it will have be lots of questions. It could be better if we've got a bit of structure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tell you everything about that interview and how you can submit a question for the composer behind the Baker Bears music on the 27th of March. That's our next patron-only show, and that will be at 2pm, with regret, British, British summertime. summertime. Oh dear, oh dear. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it. What a wonderful show it's been. Yes, it's been go and make a cottage see. pie, everyone. Yes, yes. and then yes. go forth and walk and run and adventure. Yes, and cast on something <laughs> lovely. Yes, and we'll see you in two weeks for more. See you soon. Bye. 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 Not quitting, quitting and keep the bigger repairs. They'll take you to fabulous places of which their favorites they'll share. You better buy a pad and get yourself a bigger repair. You'll find yourself in a castle while watching the bigger repairs. It never feels like a hassle to sit and watch the bigger repairs. What's on your shelf or what's in your mind?